All right, uh, this evening, what I'd like us to do since we finished uh, our, our last subject, we want to open a new one now. And I, I thought it would be um, a good idea since, uh, again, you, you probably noticed that the series we did on the Great Awakening uh, tended to awaken me somewhat to uh, the, the need of the Holy Spirit and his ministry. So I thought it would be helpful if we kind of continued along that theme and not let it drop behind us and get saturated enough with it until it finally takes hold of our lives and we begin to understand it and begin to live uh, according to uh, at least the things that we should be experiencing as Christians. Um, anyway, so we don't want to forget what the Spirit of God is capable of doing. And actually what I'd like to do during this um, uh, study is try to understand a little bit more about the Holy Spirit, try to um, understand his relationship to the other persons of the Godhead, uh, why it is that he does what he does. Again, uh, why he is the one, for instance, that's tasked with the job of turning people to Christ, or the one who tra can transform society, why that's been entrusted to him. And again, I think it's not only important in light of um, the fact that we've just gone through a study on revival, but also because um, of just the recent events. I mean, uh, you know, as you consider the, um, uh, the way the elections have gone uh, recently and just how things are in the world, I think you understand that um, we do need revival and we need to know how we ought to be seeking for that and we need to know why it is the Spirit of God is the one who actually uh, brings it about. So what I would like us for, to do, at least in our discipleship class, for the next uh, few meetings is to consider the person and work of the Holy Spirit. And I thought what we would do this evening is begin with the fact that the Holy Spirit is a person. Uh, we'll, of course, want to understand exactly what that means. We we'll want to look next week at the fact that the Holy Spirit is a divine person. And then we'll spend perhaps a couple weeks considering what it is that the Spirit of God actually uh, does, uh, what his work is to promote the kingdom of heaven, uh, both in our hearts as well as in the hearts of others. So anyway, why don't we begin with the fact that the Holy Spirit is a person, and why don't we break ground on this just simply by reading a passage of Scripture. We'll, make, uh, we'll come back to this a little bit later. But John chapter 16, if you could turn to John 16. Jesus, you know, in the upper room discourse, which um, was his time with his disciples after the Last Supper, <clears throat> had a number of things to, to talk to them about before he went to the cross, before he left. And we know that even after he died and rose again from the dead, that he still spoke to them over a period of 40 days, so he still had other things to tell them, but the things that he's focusing on in, in these chapters have a lot to do with the work of the Holy Spirit particularly in verse or chapter 16. So let me just read for you chapter 16, verses 1 through 15, just to kind of get the ball rolling. Jesus says, These things I have spoken to you, that you may be kept from stumbling. They will make you outcasts from the synagogue, but an hour is coming for everyone who kills you to think that he is offering service to God. And these things they will do because they have not known the Father or me. But these things I have spoken to you that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told you of them. And these things I did not say to you at the beginning because I was with you. But now I am going to him who sent me and none of you asked me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. But I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away for if I do not go away, the helper shall not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And he, when he comes, will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. And concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you no longer behold me. And concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. I have many more things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own initiative. But whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will disclose to you what is to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall, he shall take of mine and shall disclose it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. 
Therefore I said that he takes of mine and will disclose it to you. Now again, this, this tells us at least something of what the Spirit of God does. It tells us, actually gives to us um, several different things to, that reminds us that the Spirit of God actually is a person. And maybe we should uh, begin just by considering a couple of, well actually just one question. And that is, why would we even need to raise the question whether or not the Holy Spirit is a person? Why would we even need to ask that? Why would we even need to talk about it? Okay, and can you think of any cults that do that? Right. Okay, there are anti-Trinitarians uh, in the world, and uh, one of those uh, groups are, of course, JWs, who uh, deny the, uh, the deity of Christ, and they deny the personality of the Holy Spirit as well as his deity. They believe him just to be some kind of a force, the power of God that's sent forth that's impersonal, simply directed by God. And, of course, among anti-Trinitarians, you also have those that <clears throat> I suppose wouldn't deny the personality or deed of the Spirit, but might say the Spirit of God is one mode, or one way in which God reveals himself. He reveals himself now as the Spirit in this particular age, as the Father perhaps in the Old Testament, as the Son in the New Testament time, and then after he ascends as the Holy Spirit. But uh, we do want to consider that the Spirit of God is not only a... Um, a person and a divine person, but he is a distinct person from the Father and the Son. But we're going to consider that uh, next time when we consider the deity or divinity of the Spirit. Is there anything that might take place within even evangelical circles that might cause us to maybe think the Holy Spirit is not a person? Well, they, I, th I think they do. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, it almost sometimes it depends on which circles you're in. But sometimes it seems like they consider him to be the only person. Uh, always praying to him, always singing to him, and you don't really hear that much about Christ except he gives the spirit or he gives money. Or, or you know, I'm thinking of that type of circle. Uh, in other circles that are more balanced, they, they would still treat him as a person. They still understand that he is a, a person and a divine person. Yeah. But uh, you know how we often talk about the Spirit of God, Lord, fill me with more of your Spirit. You know, pour your Spirit out, come down on us like rain, as it were, and refresh us and things like that. Uh, we could possibly tend, because of the way we speak about the Spirit of God, as just forgetting the fact that he actually is a person. And there is one other thing that, um, and this really has to do with the work of the Holy Spirit, but... Um, when, when you read the Bible, does it, does it appear to you as though the emphasis is on the Holy Spirit? No. And why would that be? Why is it on the Spirit? Okay. You know, one other thing would be just simply the, uh, the ministry or the work of the Spirit of God is, is to draw attention to Jesus who really came that he might give glory to the Father. Now we are going to um, study this a little bit more next, next time we meet together, well, depending upon how far we get tonight too. But uh, this doesn't mean that the Spirit of God is less than the Son or the Father, but it is his particular work to draw attention to the Father and the Son, particularly to the Lord Jesus Christ, who draws attention to the Father. And the Father, of course, in turn bestows honor upon the Son, and so forth. But um, this doesn't mean that he's less than the others, but this is his particular work in the work of redemption. Erica, how are you? Good, thank you. Okay, so uh, anyway, because of the fact that, that there are anti-Trinitarians, JWs would, would tell you the Spirit of God, they would say, is not a person. And because of the Spirit's ministry, which is not to throw emphasis upon himself or to highlight himself, but rather the other persons of the Godhead, sometimes we might tend to think the Spirit of God, you know, even though we, we know in our minds that he is a person, sometimes you might tend to think of him in terms of his not being a person. So anyway, I think for these reasons it would be helpful for us to, to do a little bit of work on this area. So now let's ask this question. 
Uh, do you know what a person is? How would we define a person when we say the Holy Spirit is a person? Ty, you, what are some of the uh, characteristics of a person? You say will? Okay. All right, let me, let me see. I should have started here. There aren't that many characteristics of a person, but uh, let, let's just do this, okay? Let's, we're going to uh, define what is true of every person, what constitutes personality, and, and Ty has given us will, and that's absolutely correct. Can you think of anything else, Donna? Okay. So self-awareness. Anything else? I mean, not a collective consciousness, but an independent consciousness. Well, okay, I hadn't thought about that one, but we could, um, let's say he's an individual. He's unique, right? Or a person is a unique individual, okay? Anything else? What other kinds of attributes do people have? Is this person good or bad? What were you going to say? Okay, well, all right, yes, that's, that's kind of hard to define, isn't it? But I think that's maybe, um, you know, perhaps, perhaps the one that I'm thinking of may be what causes a person to, to have that quality that you're thinking of. Well, is this person good or bad? Um, Okay, emotion. Um, all right, um, affection. Okay, that's certainly true of persons. And yes, maybe this is what uh, makes the person what they are, is depending on what they're affected by. And I think affection might have something to do with the one that I'm looking for that nobody's actually put their, their finger on yet. Well, <clears throat> it is true that every, every person God created does have a spiritual dimension, and that personality is a part of that spiritual dimension. It's not in our flesh, it's not in our body, but it's in our soul. Uh, that, I suppose, could be true. Why don't we just go ahead and put that up there? Although I think what we're trying to think of are those qualities within that spirit that make the person but I suppose you really can't have a spirit without a person, can you? So what, what is, yes? Okay, they're, they're moral, or in, let's say they have morality. And that, that predisposition towards good or evil, I think would determine the, uh, that person's affections. Can you think of anything else the person might, might have? There is, um, I think there's at least one major one that we're missing. Oh, sorry. Reason, okay, able to reason. Or intelligence, right? Now, this would include perhaps not only the ability to reason, but I guess along with reason, perhaps an imagination and a memory. But all of that has to do with intelligence and the ability to reason. You really can't reason if you don't have an imagination, if you can't think of ideas and work with them in your mind. Well, if you, uh, let's just say your, your ability to do that would probably determine the level of intelligence that, that you have. Okay, um, let's see. I, I think we've covered everything and even perhaps more than <laughs> I originally had. Let me give you a couple of definitions. This one comes from, uh, again, the old Webster's Dictionary. What is a person, a living? Oh, I guess that's one thing we didn't put on there is they're alive. Okay, so a person is alive. Uh, a living, self-conscious being as distinct from an animal or thing. Okay, so it's a thing like a chair, a rock, doesn't have a personality. 
Um, well, this definition obviously says that animals don't have personalities, although we think, I don't really want to get, go down this road, but animals do, have, do seem to have you know, certain characteristics uh, that seem to make them or distinguish them from one another. Uh, that little you know, squeaky, weaselly dog we have next door is much different than our golden retriever. You know? It has a different kind of what we would call personality. Right? You know. Oh, there's a real dog. <laughs> okay. So some of them, you know, are trained and some of them are part of just their genetic makeup and so forth. But he also says, after he says being distinct from an animal or a thing, he says a moral agent. Okay, so we have morality up here. Uh, John Locke writes this. Consider what person stands for, which I think is a thinking intelligent being that has reason and reflection. Okay, so reflection, I think, has to do with ima uh, imagination and memory. But it, he doesn't actually add all the other elements we have, but I think we've got uh, pretty much, I think, everything that uh, makes up a person. Yes? Is yeah, I think so. I, I, you're not saying conscience, no, conscience, but consciousness. Yeah, I think it's just the awareness that you exist. Yeah. Alrighty, well then, based on this definition of a person, and by the way, we, if, if we are persons, we all are here tonight, uh, we all have these particular um, attributes as well. The question is, does the Spirit of God have these attributes? Does he qualify as a person? Now what I thought would be interesting to do would be to read several texts, and by the way, there's a lot of texts in Scripture that have to do with the personality of the Holy Spirit. And some of them would do double duty when it comes either to proving his personality or proving his divinity. So I thought um, we could you know, look at this from the standpoint of um, uh, whether or not uh, he is a person. By the way, one thing I do want us to see in here as well is, is this, that uh, oftentimes when we do a study like this, uh, we try to prove that the Holy Spirit is a person, right? Now, if you get this, let's shift the emphasis a little bit and let's try to prove that he is a person, okay? Instead of just thinking about proof, because sometimes we do this just academically, let's try to impress in our minds, in our hearts, in our, in our reasoning, that the Spirit of God is a real person, because again, sometimes I think we tend to think of him kind of like the JWs do, that he's like a force or a power. I need more or less of him and so forth, and yet he is a person, and that's why he can be grieved, for instance. That's why what we do, he's going to respond to that in some way. So we have to think of this one who dwells inside of us as a real person who, again, is, is affected in some way, or at least... Um, and I realize if we got into some deep theology here, we might see that the Spirit of God, like God himself, is, that never really changes no matter what we do. I mean, and that's true. But he does reveal to us certain things regarding his, his character that seem to be responses to things that we do. And uh, it can be either good or bad, you see. So he is a person who responds to what we do. There's certainly no question about that. So let's, uh, let's first of all go back to the text we looked at to begin with, and that would be John chapter 16. And I was thinking what I'll do is I'll just point out some verses. If, if you can turn it up in your Bibles, if you want to participate in this, turn it up in your Bibles, and um, what we'll do is consider perhaps uh, as we look at each of the things that Jesus here says about the Holy Spirit, uh, which maybe which attribute he's actually referring to here in this category. This might be kind of difficult to do, and some of them might actually have some overlap. Okay, So first of all, in verse 7 of John chapter uh, 16, But I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the Helper shall not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you. Is there an attribute or is there a, uh, a characteristic of personality in this particular verse? That he's a helper, okay? And as you think about the different things that make up a person, what, what exactly is that? I mean, which category would it fall under? Where do you think it matters? 
He's a helper. Okay. So helper might have something to do with his heart as far as um, why he is doing it. Okay. But the fact that he's doing something, what else does that fall under? Well, I suppose you have to be able to do all these, have all these attributes to be able to do it, but time? Ty, are you answering this question or are you talking about something else? Okay, I, I think the main idea here is he helps and he comforts with regard to, to paraclete, but that, that may be an aspect of it. So, so are you saying all of these things are... Okay, well, I don't think we're trying to divide God up here. No. I think we're just trying to say which attribute, which, which aspect of personality perhaps jumps out to you when you see this particular attribute. I was thinking personally that Will was the one that was perhaps more in line here because he's coming to do something. And I realize that all these things are necessary. He has to have intelligence to do that and self-awareness and so forth. I'll tell you what, why don't we just... Um, We'll just go on to the next verse and forget about which of these it actually falls into. Let's just look at the different ones that, um, different aspects of personality that come out, okay? How about verse eight? And he, when he comes, will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. What's that? Morality. Okay, morality, well, that's the category again, isn't it? So what is it that he's going to be doing here? or uh, at least bringing a conviction that, that particular, you know, particular behaviors are sinful. Okay, so he's, he's impressing then at least some kind of knowledge, isn't he, on the person, uh, probably working through conscience in this case. Remember, conscience means with knowledge. And there is this, I, I think according to scripture, an innate knowledge within us that uh, of what is right and wrong, and the Spirit of God brings that message uh, home, doesn't he, in this idea of conviction? Well, he just simply, he simply has to um, well, work with the knowledge that's already there, and perhaps could also appeal to what that person's learned in their life, you know, what they've experienced, perhaps bringing certain ideas to mind uh, that would, uh, you know, at least certain memories of that person and then causing uh, certain sensations in, um, you know, in where we feel sensation. I think it's typically in the bowels or the, the gut, as it were. Um, the Bible often talks about the bowels of compassion, hey, Paul. Uh, we, we feel a sensation uh, when, when, you know, when our conscience is striking us, okay? So he probably causes that to take place. Uh, let's look at, we're in uh, John chapter 16 in verse 13 now. We're looking at the, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit and uh, we're looking now at the fact that he is a person because of, you know, the anti-Trinitarians, because of uh, sometimes the fact that uh, the Spirit of God is not, uh, his ministry is not to draw attention to himself, but rather to Christ and to the Father. So we're, we're just wanting to... Um, uh, really nail down in our minds and hearts the fact that this one who worked during the Great Awakening and this one whom we absolutely need in order to live the kind of life God calls us to live is a person who responds to the different things that we do. So let's look at verse 13. And there's actually several in here. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth for he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will disclose to you what is to come. So what are some of the attributes of personality that come out of this, out of this verse? Truth. Okay. Uh, guide. Okay. Truth. All right, so guiding the truth seems to uh, re refer to some kind of a teaching work of the Holy Spirit. Okay. He, he speaks. That's right. 
Um, Okay, so he's guiding the truth, he's speaking, he's coming. Uh, what else do we see in here? He hears. he hears. Now, again, remember that the Jehovah's Witnesses and all anti-Trinitarians who deny the personality and deity of the Holy Spirit, they, they believe that he's no different than, let's say, this, this stone wall or maybe a, um, a tidal wave. You know, he's the power of God sent forth to accomplish a particular purpose. But if, you, if you're looking at a tidal wave, it might have power and it might have the ability to, to do something like devastate something. But can we say that it guides into the truth? Can we say that it speaks and that it hears? You know, I mean, we can't say that about a tidal wave or any kind of impersonal force. Only, you can only say that about a person. All modalists, um, well, in, in, uh, I'm, can you think of an exception? No. Oh. You know, uh, from, from what I understand, uh, modalism basically teaches there's one person but just different modes, so that would be anti-Trinitarian, yeah. Uh, there's, there's also something else in here that, that's perhaps more obvious that um, in, in verse 13 that speaks of the personality of the Holy Spirit, and nobody's actually hit that one yet. The pronoun he. The personal pronoun, he, okay. Now, one thing that Jehovah's Witnesses will point out, and uh, sometimes they do it accurately, and that is the fact that when you have a personal pronoun, or uh, let's say a pronoun, any kind of a pronoun, a near demonstrative, far demonstrative, relative pronoun, or whatever it may be, that when it refers to the Holy Spirit, it is always in the neuter, okay? The one thing about Greek is uh, it has different genders. We have different genders in our language, he, she, and it. They also have that. But uh, when, we, um, when we use the term, uh, we, well, we, of course, have different words for that purpose. They have one word that has different endings. And when you have the word spirit in the Bible, you'll often have a, um, a pronoun that is in the neuter. And the reason you do is because you have to have agreement between the noun and the pronoun that refers to it as far as gender. And the fact is the word spirit is neuter, okay? That's because that's what that word is in the Greek. It's the word for wind, it's the word for breath, it's the word for spirit. But it's in the neuter because the noun itself historically is neuter. It doesn't actually speak about, you know, um, I mean, most winds and, and most breaths are impersonal. But the Spirit of God, of course, is not. Now, in this case, and the reason why I pointed out here is because in this case, in this verse, the word he there actually is masculine, even though it is referring to the word spirit, which is neuter. And that's a very interesting uh, feature of this particular verse and of what Jesus is saying because he is using... A, a pronoun that you would typically use for a person, and he's not making, he's not, there's no agreement between the, the noun and the pronoun as far as gender. So in other words, Jesus is going an extra step further to point out that the Spirit of God actually is personal. Does that make sense? Okay, maybe you've heard that before. Okay, verse 14, he shall glorify me, for he shall take of mine and shall disclose it to you. What, what attributes do we have there of personality? Okay, he, he, he glorifies Jesus. Can you, um, again, this is, this is something that he does of volition or of will. Okay, he will glorify me. And notice also he takes of what is mine and shall disclose it to you. And I think there it's talking about the truth of God again as well. Yeah, I think so, yeah. It, it's basically uh, revealing to them the truth. Okay, now we do have several others that we can look at, and I'm, I'm looking at the time, not wanting to go uh, too far over a quarter till to, to finish, but can you believe it? We're already pressing the time limit. It seems like we just started. So let's, let me just um, assign verses, if I can do that. So I, if, if you have a Bible, please volunteer, because I have a few of these. Ephesians 4.30. Okay, Don, you can take that one. 
Uh, Acts 7:51. Okay, uh, I'll, we'll let Brian have that one. Acts 5, verses 1 through 5. Okay, we'll let Erica have that one. Then Sarah, if you want to take Matthew 12, verses 31 through 32. And Dick, you were, did you have your hand up? Do you want to get in there? Acts 13, verses 1 through 4. Oh boy, got a bunch more here. Okay, Jerry, okay, uh, John 14, 26. Anybody else? Uh, okay, Kathy, would you take Acts 9, 31? And I saw another hand back over there, Ty. If you would take 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21. And um, let's just, oh, did you, did you already take one? No, I already have one. Okay. Why don't we just go with these to begin with? Okay, first of all, Ephesians 4, 30. If you would just read the passage and, um, you know, it, just indicate what you think demonstrates personality in the Holy Spirit. So, Donnie, you had that one? Okay, or uh, affection, I guess, okay, and um, all right. Okay. Now, just on this one point of grieving, it, it is interesting. The word itself means to make sad, sorrowful, or distressed. Uh, I, I think that's, that's pretty well contained in the word itself, but just think about that. When we do something that is contrary to the will of God, when we do something that is sinful, it, it actually, in in, in some sense, grieves or makes the Holy Spirit sad that we do that. Uh, and again, you know, we can get into some deeper theology here to try to understand what that means, but this is the way the Spirit of God has chosen to relate himself to us, that when we do something that is dishonoring to him, in, in some sense, it saddens him, it distresses him. Uh, because the Holy Spirit, first of all, loves us, if we are Christ, and he wants us to do what's right. His job is to lead us into all the truth. He's trying to help us. He's trying to teach us. He's trying to guide us. And we're fighting against him. And as we do that, he relates himself to us as one who is sad, saddened by that. So realizing that, uh, first of all, he loves us. And second of all, that we should love him. We should do all that we can. And this is what I meant by focusing on the fact that the Holy Spirit is a person rather than just trying to prove that he is. Let's focus on the fact that he is, and then let's treat him as such, okay? A divine person, but a person who can be uh, affected in some way by what we do, okay? All right, now who has Acts 7, 51? Brian? Okay, now, what is the Holy Spirit? In this case, this is where um, Stephen was rebuking the leaders of Israel. What is it the Spirit of God was trying to get them to do? To believe on Christ. <laughs> right, and, and obey and, and so forth, but yet they have a pattern of disobedience all the way through. So the Holy Spirit is trying to get them to do what's right, and they are resisting him. And again, just think, think of of the wind when you resist the wind, think of waves when you resist the waves, they have no purpose behind what they're doing except whatever purpose God may have. They personally do not, because they were not personal, but they do not have purpose, but the Spirit of God does. He is not just an impersonal force. So he's trying to get them to go one way and they're fighting against him. And again, we can also resist the Holy Spirit. He's given to us to guide us and he wants us to go a particular way, and we're either going to walk with him or we're going to fight against him. And when we fight against him, it's in some sense grieves him. Okay, so something else to think about. Uh, Acts five verses one through five. Words, 
Okay. Now, what does this say about the, a uh, personal characteristic of the Holy Spirit? Okay, how could you tell he was angry? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, actually, yeah, he, yeah, I don't think he just dropped dead. I think he was struck dead, right? So, yes, yeah, so an act. Yes. Now, if, if, well, of course, one thing we should think about is, is that even in a situation like this, it, it could have been possible that Ananias was a Christian, although I think the evidence is against him, because Christians can lie, and some Christians can sin so severely that they can actually die. You know, and that, and that, actually that would be an act of God to discipline. Although I think Ananias in his scheming with his wife and so forth, it's, it seems that the Spirit of God wants to tell us that he was not converted. But again, think about this. The Spirit of God is a person who can be lied to, somebody who is affected by these lies and who even responds to them and reacts to them. Again, that could not be true of a, uh, an impersonal force. So what does this tell us about how we should respond to the Holy Spirit? He is the spirit of truth. He comes to lead us into the truth. We want to make sure we don't lie to him. <laughs> uh, I mean, I don't think Ananias was intending to do this as far as lying to the Holy Spirit. But when he brought what he had and said this was all that I sold the property for, uh, he did in fact lie to the Holy Spirit in doing so when he lied to the apostles, or at least to Peter. Um, and the result was he was struck down. Did Ananias deserve that? Absolutely. Because God doesn't mete out what a person doesn't deserve. But again, we do need to be careful. The Spirit of God is a person and not just a force. And he's with us. So we do need to make sure we treat him well. Okay, who has Matthew 12, 31 through 32? Okay, good. And what about this indicates that the Spirit of God is a person? Well, here, if, if you're having difficulty, let's first of all, let's first of all define, because I think the word that we're looking at here might be, un, um, yeah, the word blasphemy may be um, unfamiliar to you. Okay, the word blasphemy means a slander or an insult against God. Okay. Now, how, how would that show you that the Spirit of God is a person? Okay, he, he's offended, isn't he? Because he's the one that's blasphemed, isn't he? Jesus says that any sin will be forgiven, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Well, blasphemy is a slander or an insult, and you can't... You can't insult the wall. Can you, can you insult the wall? And if, you, if you took a sledgehammer and you took it to the wall, you still wouldn't be insulting the wall, would you? No, because you can only do that to a person who has feelings, right? Now, what else, though, is obvious in here? If, if you blaspheme the spirit... That's right. So they can't be the same person, right? What does this say about the, um, well, we're going to get to this, of course, next time, but what does it say about the deity of the Holy Spirit? Yeah. Because can, can I blaspheme you and can you blaspheme me? No, because we're just human beings, right? I'm not God, you're not God, but he is. He can be blasphemed, right? I mean, that, here, well, here's a proof for the, the deity of the Holy Spirit. Okay. Anyway. Pastor, I'm sorry. I've got to back up for a second. Is it, is it a thing that 
I'm not aware of any. Blas I think blasphemy is if you rail against God, you, yeah. Yeah. I, I'm not aware of any. I, but we should look into that. But I do think that blasphemy is actually something that can only be committed against God. Okay. All righty. Um, hmm. Let's see. Acts 13, verses 1 through 4. Now, what do you see in this passage regarding the person of the Spirit? Okay. He, he, he speaks, and in his speaking, what did he actually issue there? A command. So he has authority, right? And uh, again, will. Of course, his will is simply according to the will of his Father, or not his Father, but in this case, the will of the Father. Um, so he speaks, he commands, he does have telos, he has purpose, he has, you know, there's a certain thing he wants to accomplish. Uh, notice another personal pronoun here, set apart for me, you know. That's something that the wall doesn't talk about, it doesn't say me, it doesn't talk, it doesn't command, it doesn't have purpose, okay. Were those all the ones I had assigned or were there any others? Okay, Jerry, what do you have? You have John 14, 26? Okay. Okay, so he's, he's a teacher, and uh, there's also, well, in his teaching, it also says that he will bring to their remembrance, which means he also reminds them, and that's something, of course, a good teacher will do. Alrighty, and then Acts 9.31, did somebody have that one? Okay. Again, the idea of comfort, which could come from applying the promises of God or um, even could bring perhaps, you know, that kind of comfort where when you're, you're going through trials and your heart is caving in, how the Spirit of God seems to just keep you from utter despair. Uh, that's kind of an existential sort of a thing, but it's, it's there. It's something we experience. Had I assigned any other verses or was that the last one? Second Peter? Oh, Ty, you've got that one? Okay. Right, so what, what are the characteristics of personality that you see there? And he helps in terms of uh, what man cannot do by his own self. And he does so with such a perfection that when scripture is given, it seems clear that uh, by the Holy Spirit spoke through God. Okay. And this appears again to be the um, Spirit's 
teaching ministry in a certain sense. I think revelation is still teaching. Um, and if it's being given for the first time, so here the Spirit of God is again using his, his teaching uh, ministry. I had just two more. Let me just read through them quickly. And the, the second one is very much like the one Ty just read. 1 Peter 1, verses 10 through 12. As to this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful searches and inquiries, seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you in these things which now have been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels longed to look. So again, the idea of the Spirit of God working within the prophets, predicting uh, the, the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. So again, the teaching and revealing ministry of the Holy Spirit and moving and empowering the apostles to preach. And then the last one, Romans 8, verses 26 through 27. Again, this talks about the intercession of the Holy Spirit. In the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness for we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Notice the Spirit of God has a mind. Okay? He, um, he has self-awareness, he has intelligence, he has a certain purpose, and he is praying for the saints. And again, the wind can't pray, the waves can't pray, and personal forces can't pray. But one who is a person can. Now, again, um, there are several other passages in Scripture, but I think this should be enough to demonstrate and, and perhaps answer the questions, okay? Would you say from the things that we've just looked at that the, that the Holy Spirit is alive? Okay, would you say that he has a will? Does he appear to have self-awareness? Is he aware of his own existence? Okay, is he an individual? Okay, we already saw he was separated from the Son. Blasphemy against the Spirit won't be forgiven. Is he a spirit? Well, of course. Does he have affection? Does he have a desire for something? You know? Well, yes, God's will. He is morally pure and holy. Would we say that he exhibits intelligence? Is he able to reason? Imagination and memory, I, I would say the Spirit of God certainly can see, see things, understand them. I mean, imagination doesn't mean you're imagining things that aren't there. It just means that um, you can see in your mind certain things. You have to be able to do that in order to reason. You know, they have to get up into RAM, as it were, and you work with them, and then you come to a conclusion. If you couldn't get anything up there, you wouldn't be able to conclude anything. You wouldn't be able to reason. Okay, so I would say from what we've seen that the Holy Spirit meets the criteria. He meets the definition of a person. So basically, the one whom, with whom we have to do, the one who indwells us, is not just a, um, a new principle of life, I mean, he is, that causes us to love what is good. It's not just like you know, a changed nature in that um, you know, our affections have changed, but what has changed us is not personal. That one who indwells us is, in fact, a person. And one that we saw does not like to be lied to, and doesn't like it when we sin and do things contrary to the will of God. Uh, he's grieved by these things. He can be resisted. He has a will. He wants us to do certain things. He wants to guide us in a certain direction. So we need to remember that, um, again, the Holy Spirit is a person. So we have proven that he is a person. I, I really don't know how you could come away with anything else except if you really haven't seen these things, if you haven't read enough of the Bible to understand this, a Jehovah's Witness comes to you and he tries to tell you the Holy Spirit is just an impersonal force. You might be duped for a while, but if you read the Bible for any period of time, I don't think there's any question. You have to come to this conclusion. Okay? But again, that's just one thing. We've proven he's a person, but remember then, having shown you that this is the case, remember that you have a person that is dwelling in your soul besides you, okay, and that is the Spirit of God. And he is, we're going to see, a divine person. He is holy. 
He has desires for you to do the right thing. And when you don't do the right thing, he doesn't like it. As a matter of fact, yes. Uh, yes. If you uh, think about, or if you want to turn up uh, Galatians 5.17, 5.16 and 17, but I say walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another so that you may not do the things that you please. Basically, it's talking about a war that's going on within your soul. And within my soul, the spirit in there is that principle of new life that, that causes us to desire what is good and right. But it's not just an impersonal force. It's not just a change of nature. It is a person who is living in us, who has desires for us and wants, to go, wants us to go a particular way. By the way, this is also what Paul means in Romans chapter 8. Uh, and actually, uh, what uh, the author to the Hebrews, when he's interpreting the uh, New Covenant, where, it's, where he says that um, the, the Old Covenant, which was basically the law written on stones, was not able to change your nature. Because he says, they didn't continue in my covenant and I didn't care for them, says the Lord. But this is a new covenant that I'm going to make with you. I'm going to take those laws and I'm going to write them on your heart. That writing of the law on the heart is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, is that person of the Spirit of God living in your heart. And that's what um, uh, Paul is actually referring to when he uh, talks about, um, in Romans chapter 8, for the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. And what he means there by law is not the, the commandments, it's, uh, he's talking about that principle of the Spirit that is now placed within your heart, sets you free from that principle of sin that we were bound to previously. So now we're set free. That's what uh, actually Charles Wesley was referring to when he says, you know, long lay my nature fast bound, actually my soul in fast bound in sin and nature's night. Thine eye diffused a quickening ray, my chains broke off, and basically he was freed, okay? The idea is we were bound by our sin nature, we were bound by sin, but the presence of the Spirit of God, the law or the principle of the Spirit in our heart sets us free. But again, it's not just a new nature, it's not just a new principle, it is the Spirit himself who lives within us. Okay, so that's really the point I want us to get. The Spirit is a person and he lives in us and we do need to be careful how we relate to him. Pastor, could it be that people come to that conclusion even before because they look at the things in black and think the Spirit of God? Well, I think sometimes you have in the Old Testament the idea of God sends forth his Spirit and something happens, you know, and they, they think that, that it's just the, the divine power of God being exerted in a particular way, but this divine power has all these attributes, yeah, you see. That, yeah. They have no other thing that that could exist. Well, that those are some of the verses that JWs would point to. And, and even well-meaning Christians who haven't yet seen and understood these other things. I mean, you have to admit that when you first become a Christian and you're challenged, let's say, by a Jehovah's Witness on the deity of Christ, you might have a hard time proving that. You, and I, I mean, several, several people I know as well as myself have gone through times where we've wondered whether they might be right, you know, just because of our ignorance of what the scriptures say. But once you see all the proofs of the deity of Christ, you just, you can't doubt anymore. And of course, you hope that by communicating that to a Jehovah's Witness and praying for them, the Lord might show them that as well. As long as they believe that Jesus isn't God, as long as they deny the Holy Spirit, they have a false God and they cannot be saved. Hope time. Actually, I didn't quote Romans 8, 1. No, but I did go on to verse 2. Well, you know, it's interesting. That particular part of the verse is 
the textual evidence for it is not terribly strong, but it's not anti-biblical to be sure. And I would say that if, in fact, the Lord intends that to be in there, I think it would be, yes, by the principle of the power of the Holy Spirit. Well, yes, except what it means here is is not yeah it's it's walk of course means living, and that i that I live the kind of life God wants me to live by the power of the holy spirit and yes it it sometimes could be um, perhaps expressed as walking with the Lord, you know because you're going the direction he wants you to go if we walk in the light as he is in the light, if we live in a way that is pleasing to the Lord, then the the blood of Jesus' Son cleanses us from all unrighteousness and so forth. Yeah. So yes, the Spirit, as I've said before, or as the Scripture tells us, is trying to lead us and guide us in a particular way. And if we go that way, then that is walking with Him. That is yielding to the Spirit. If we resist that, it's resisting and grieving the Spirit of God, which quenches His influence in our life, which is something we do not want to do. Now, next time... We're going to look at the, um, the, the three persons of the Godhead and the particular relationship that the Spirit of God has with the Father and the Son. And we're going to look again at why the Spirit is called the Holy Spirit. I mean, why is He not called the Son? Why is the Son called the Son? Why is the Spirit not called the Son and the Father and so forth? So we'll consider those relationships. And then we'll, uh, we'll see that the Spirit of God is in fact uh, God. And then we'll um, want to consider why it is in the, what we call the economy of salvation or the economy of redemption, why the Father does what He does, the Son does what He does, and particularly why the Spirit does what He does in the things that we've just actually even looked at. Why is He the one that indwells us? Why is He the one who guides us? Why is His presence in us producing what it produces? Okay, so um, anyway, we'll want to see again how important the work of the Spirit of God is to perhaps help us to be more cautious, considering He's a person and considering what it is He's seeking to do within us, why we should make sure that we, we don't resist Him, but that we yield to Him and go the direction that He's calling us to go, uh, why it's important for us to do that, to preserve that influence so that we might bring the greatest glory to Jesus Christ and to the Father. If we resist the Spirit, uh, we're not going to be able to do that. Uh, are there any questions or comments at this point? Why don't we quickly close with a word of prayer, and then we'll gather again in the back uh, to spend some time in prayer. Shall we pray?